I have Bucky Irving. Whoa. He's outside your top 10? Yes. Oh, dude. No, you're a hater, dude. You're a massive hater. I am scarred on really, really small backs that are bad athletes. (sighs) I love his vision. Bucky Irving was a 100th percentile player when it comes to missed tackles forced per attempt. This guy had almost B. John Robinson level missed tackles forced per attempt averages. I am just such a sucker for a good vision back. I think he's draftable. Oh, he's using the word draftable. (laughs) He's using Uh, the word draftable. He definitely is. Fifth round, sign me up. Connor wouldn't take him through the seventh. (laughs) No, no, he's a top of day three kind of pick. Welcome to the opening bell of the NFL Stock Exchange Podcast. I'm Trevor Sykema. That is Connor Rogers joining you guys for a ranking episode. Connor feels like that we have not done a ranking episode in a long, long time, but we're getting back to it. We got about four or five weeks left until the 2024 NFL draft. So we got to give you these maybe not exactly final, but close to final rankings that we have for some of these positions as we get to draft weekend today. We're doing running backs. We're going to give you our top 10 running backs, Connor's top 10 running backs, my top 10 running backs. And as always, I have no idea what the hell he's about to say. I don't know any of the rankings. I don't really know how he feels about these players. Obviously, I've kind of seen the top 10, the top 75, things like that. But I'm excited for this one, man. How you doing, Connor? I'm good. Uh, we are recording a rare stock exchange morning for us. We this don't is have, true. We don't have many of these. It feels, we don't. It's kind of a really nice way to start the day. Uh, I woke up. I snuck in one more running back before we taped and... Uh, that player didn't make the top 10, but still, we're going to try to talk about as many as we can after the top 10. Yeah, I feel like with this group, Trevor, and I could definitely be lying here, but I think I'm not. With wide receiver, I find myself tinkering all the time. Like I did a top 20 uh, last week for NBC and a couple people tweeted me like, is this different than your stock exchange ones? And I'm thinking to myself, like, I'm sure it is. That was December. I think we did that because there's for so wide many. Receiver, yeah. yeah, there's so many players in that. 30 to 65 overall range that they could bump down three or four spots and they drop a spot or two in the wide receiver rankings with running backs. I do think there's a cluster, but I don't think there's anything jarring in terms of changes overall. Um, Now that we've done this exercise, there is one guy that I think I came in higher on and I ended up lower on. There were two guys that really, really surprised me. So I think while it doesn't have a first rounder and maybe not a second rounder, I think there's some really fun conversations around this group. I think we should have second rounders I, I, from this group. I really do. And I agree. Um, I just don't know if we certainly will. <sighs> Cowboys <laughs> seem like the most likely one, but we'll see. Yeah, I, I think we do because as much as there are a lot of running backs, like I do believe the running back run is going to start somewhere in the middle of the second round. And I think right when that first running back comes off the board, teams are going to go, okay, we want this guy. We want this guy. So there might be – there's a world where there's zero running backs in the top 50. Right, and I agree with that. from 50 to 64 to round out the second round, we might get three, right? So yeah. I think that that's, my, that's maybe where we're, we're going to be at. For these top 10s, and we're going to go – as you guys know from this show, we'll go from 10 all the way down to one. We're going to lump kind of 10 and six together, mention all those, talk about them, and then we'll get into the top fives um, individually. But – you know, for this 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 running back group, I found myself making natural tiers for a lot of these guys. Of these, it's, it's like okay, like I, I'd take any of these three. Um, there are traits that I like with this guy. There's other traits I like with this guy. There's some cons to each one of them as well. So I'm excited to kind of get into it and get into this conversation. And so with that, man, let's let's just kick it right off. I'll, I'll have you go ten through six. Tell me who your ten through six are. Uh, I'll have some follow up questions. We'll have a discussion about that, and then we'll do the same for myself as well. All right, so 10 through 6 here. Number 10, uh, the Combine superstar, Louisville's Isaac Garendo. Nice, okay. All right. He snuck in at 10, and we'll have a longer combo about him. Number 9, Will Shipley from Clemson, a guy we talked pretty extensively about on our summer scouting episode. Mm -hmm. Number 8, Ray Davis from Kentucky, an older prospect, a guy that's well-traveled. I think he's been through three programs and was a senior bowl player. Uh, number seven, another senior bowl player in Marshawn Lloyd 
from U- uh, from USC, another transfer, I believe a former five star in mm-hmm. Lloyd. And then number six, Blake Corum from Michigan. Oh, wow. You got Blake at six. And listen, uh, Blake is a really impressive college player. I think he has a really high floor as an NFL back. But you'll notice with the guys that I have ahead of him when we get to the top five, they just have more special traits than him. And in this position, I really value traits so much. You got to be productive. You do have to have, you know, certain pro aspects, but it's just a position in the NFL where this might shock you. The really big, the really fast, the really explosive guys are often the best at that position in the NFL. Right. Dude, this is fascinating because you and I's list is going to be very different. That's and great. It, no, it is because we, we, I think we align on a lot of different prospects. We see the game very similarly. And I think the people who listen to this podcast and watch this podcast like that because I hope that we do a good job of identifying good talent. So naturally, I think that we're going to agree on a lot of stuff. But this, I can already tell, is an episode where we might not be heated on one side or the other, <laughs> but how we are dividing up this running back group and the, the traits that we prioritize are a little bit different, though. So I think it's going to make for a great conversation because uh, I already think that there is at least one, but there might be two guys in your top five that I don't even have in my top nine, I will say. So um, interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I I, I think that uh, this is going to be fun. So uh, let's talk about your your 10 through six first, though. Let's talk about Isaac Garendo. Um, I would love to hear, and I'm, I'm pretty close to where you're at. He did not make my top 10. He was somebody I was going to shout out at the end of the show, because obviously the combine numbers are bonkers, but yeah. What do you think about Isaac Rando? Obviously he sneaks into your top 10. You think this is just a guy who's, Hey, so athletic. You got to throw him out there and you got to figure out what you got. The funny thing is I really on tape, like the kind of runner he is pound for pound better than anything he did at the combine. I, I don't. It was one of those misleading things where, I mean, just for people that don't know with Garendo, at the combine, he came in six feet, 221 pounds. He had a 4-3-3-40, which is 98th percentile. He had a 41 and a half inch vertical, which is 97th percentile, 129 inch broad jump, which is 95th percentile. And at that alarming size, he still ran a sub 7-3 cone, 6-9-4, which is 71st percentile, but at his size, that's pretty impressive. Oh, it's incredible. Yeah, it's really impressive. So let's start with the good. I I mean, with him, he obviously has size, speed, and I think that translates to two simple things. One, he can really lower his pads and run through contact high and low. I saw guys bounce off his legs. I saw guys bounce off his shoulders, and I saw when he when it was blocked up, his ability to actually stick his foot in the ground and start galloping and he's gone, right? That's, that's the thing with Garendo that you look at. I want to read off his uh, explosive runs this year. So he had 22 explosive runs, runs of 10 plus yards or more, Mm -hmm. but he only had 132 carries, right? So that's a pretty good explosive run rate. When you see guys that have 30 or, you know, whatever like that, they're probably trending towards having it almost 200 carries. So now, obviously once again the kind of athlete he is i think he catches the ball well where if you get that kind of athleticism in space if you have any kind of slip screen with blockers out in front like just once again the ability that he can gallop just covers up so much turf um he's got the size that i think when the awareness fully comes into play with more reps he's going to be able to block blitzing linebackers and dbs i mean he's a bigger back back there so when you factor in the kind of athlete he is and that he can catch the ball you feel good about him being able to develop into a three down back now why he's number 10 right everybody listening is like well all that athleticism and and all these great things about him like why is he not higher i don't think he has great feel as a runner Mm -hmm. i think there's times where it's just very clunky and because of that you see the 41 and a half inch vertical I don't think he's that explosive off the touch. I don't think he gets the ball on your like, remember when watching Chase Brown, because Chase Brown was one of the last big testers I could think of. Yeah. With Brown, he had some runs where you'd be like, whoa, like he fired out of a cannon. That's, That's how I it felt him. like with him. 
Right. And I, I mean, I know they signed Zach Moss, but I think Brown's got a good shot to win that backfield this year. 40 inch vertical for Brown. And he was smaller than Garendo. He was heavy, mm. but he was only about five nine. Yeah. I, I didn't see that with Garendo where he got the ball and it was like, oh my God, he's at the second level so fast. And now he unlocks this four three speed and he's big and can run over DBs all the time. It felt like it really had to be there for him to get to the second level. I think he he's just a little clunkier off the touch. And it's not that none of those great things matter if you can't get yourself to the second level as a runner. It's just that mm-hmm. the impact of them becomes a little bit minimized. So with Garendo, if he continues to grow as a runner with more reps, he could be a legitimate starting NFL running back. I just don't think he's there yet. And I can't tell if it's experience or the fact that he doesn't have some of those more, I don't want to say between the ears kind of gifts. It's more just feel is what yeah. it is. Like natural feel and flow as a runner. Yeah. So look, this guy was a track star coming out of high school, both in the hundred meter dash and the long jump. So the explosiveness has been there for a long time for him. Uh, he was at Louisville, but he was at Wisconsin before that. Yeah. And he really barely got the ball while he was at Wisconsin. He goes to Louisville and we go, man, I like this guy better as a pro than Jawar Jordan, who was the guy who got most of the carries at Louisville. But yeah. you wonder, okay, well, why is that the case? You kind of turn on the tape, and I agree with you. The very first, um, I guess, like the tractor on his scouting report that I have is, I wish he'd run with more violence. Like, I don't think that he runs as decisive. He doesn't run as confident. You he are 6'1", 220 pounds. Like, put, yeah. go, man. Like, there are, there are a couple of reps that I can remember where he really threw his shoulder into somebody with that power and that speed, that momentum, and it really allowed him to dictate the contact. I did not see that nearly as much as I thought that I was going to. So it's not that I don't think that he can be a, you know, uh, uh, an early down back. Well, I mean, he's a good pass protector and I think he's got good hands as well. So like in any down back at at the NFL level, he has the physical gifts to do that. But if, if you've gone to two different programs now and you haven't been able to be a starting back at either one of them with these kinds of physical abilities, I worry if this is just kind of your style. Like if you, if coaches are going to look at you and your body type and what you bring to the field athletically, and if you don't bring that violent type of running style, I just, I'm not so sure that it's going to warrant a lot more carries like you're kind of alluding to he might need. I don't, I don't know if he gets that. So he is right outside of my top 10. I noticed the physical gifts as well. I think he's 13th for me. Um, but that was my that was my big concern with him as well as I thought he was going to run with a more north to south violence in his game. And I just didn't see it as often as I thought I was going to. So Well, then you can see why he ended up at that era of Wisconsin, right? Not this era of Wisconsin, but the previous era of Wisconsin where it's, you know, you're big, you're fast, go downhill. Mm-hmm. We recruit the big track guys. And uh, obviously it didn't it didn't work out there for some of the reasons you said. So the other backs that you had uh Law, who was it? Law, and this might not be in the, the right order, but yeah, Shipley, Shipley Lloyd. Davis, Lloyd Corum. Okay, so we'll talk about Corum. Obviously, I think there's right. a lot of people out there who really like Will Shipley, and um, I have him in my top ten as well. Actually, do I have the rest of those guys in my top ten? I might. Hold on, I think the numbers might be wrong here. I would think you have Lloyd. But you never know. It's it's pretty open. In this. Yes. Okay. So most of mine is the same. So I, I'm going to read you my 10 yeah. through 6 because I think some of the conversations we can just have you know, as a whole. So my number 10 guy is Braylon Allen from Wisconsin. Um, do you have Braylon in your top five? He's number five. Okay. So he's he's one of those that's in there. Okay. I have Braylon Allen at 10. Um, I have Tyrone Tracy from Purdue at 9. Is he in your top five? Yeah, he's number four. Okay, I think I thought that he was going to be in your top five. Yeah. So I have Will Shipley at eight. I have Marshawn Lloyd at seven. And then I have Ray Davis at number six. So we see that grouping of the yeah, running we do. backs. I think very much the same. It's just the other two guys that are there. So 10 for me is Braylon Allen from Wisconsin. Nine for me is Tyrone Tracy, the former wide receiver, who is now a running back who's coming from Purdue. Will Shipley from Clemson is eight. Marshawn Lloyd from USC is seven and Ray Davis from Kentucky is six. Do you have any of those guys that you want to start the conversation with, whether it was one of the three that we shared similarly or Tracy or Allen? Where did you have Shipley? Eight. Eight. So, okay. So I have Shipley nine. So that's an easy one. So, okay. With Shipley, I think a lot of people out there look at Shipley and they just see a future productive pro, right? They, they think of 
the, all the stereotypes that are out there, right? The, the Danny Woodheads, the, <laughs> the, the, the Austin Eckler, it's like whatever you, they just like think yeah. that it's that next type of player. And when I watch Shipley, the skill sets, I can understand how people come to that conclusion outside of just saying they're white. Um, I think that he's <laughs> a really good receiver. They're shifty. They make people miss in space. The thing that held me back from really, really loving Will Shipley is I don't think that he's built very densely is probably the no, way that I would put it. It's the main he, problem. He goes down on time. And it's not like he, I, and he, here's the difference, people, because I know that y'all are going to send me clips of him bouncing off the tackle and being able to like stay on his feet and get some yards after contact that exists in his tape. But he gets knocked off balance way too easy. And even for the great balance that he has, I saw him go to the ground a lot easier than I thought he was going to. So I, this guy is just I, – I don't really care what the scale says. I don't really care what weight you're going to throw out at me. He's light. He's light for a running back. And I think yep. that that is a – that's not something that I love on your scouting profile going into the NFL when the hits only get stronger and harder. So – that was the big thing for me. Great, elusive athlete, really nice, soft hands out of the backfield. But I didn't really trust what he was going to be as a yards after contact type of player. He reminded me of Ty Chandler a little bit. Um, the build, the skill set, you know, coming out of college, the pass catching and return ability. I think that, you know, you brought up Eckler. That's kind of the role you, you would love to see Shipley in. The concerns for me, because we know what he's impactful on these, you know, Swing passes where he could use his speed to win the sideline. He runs very skinny. He's got good acceleration. He's a great mm -hmm. athlete. Uh, he's Formal a former lacrosse player. Yeah, he got like, scholarship offers to play lacrosse. Right. I mean, like just a supernatural yeah. athlete, I think. Also, Here, a black belt in karate. Shout I out. didn't know I that. Do that. Yeah, I do know he's the first scholarship player in Clemson history to graduate in three years with a 4.0 GPA. I'm pretty sure. Wow. Which is, that's unbelievable it's pretty good. number one i couldn't imagine graduating college in three years yeah. let alone doing also, it with a 4-0 while playing football <laughs> so i was about to say why would you want to graduate college in four, in three years right well if you're a football player it's awesome correct and then i thought like wait Remember a second Tabandre sweat Tabandre sweat at the combine told me i said like why were you such a better pass rusher this year? And he's like, because I was done with school. I just had an internship. <laughs> oh, man. That's and I was like, I was like, you know what? That's a really fair answer. It's hard to hard to be going you, to 50 classes and getting better at football. I don't remember. I cannot remember if this was just a rumor that was made up or if it was true. But Matt Leinert's last year at USC, the common knowledge, I guess, was that the only class that he had on USC's campus was ballroom dancing that last wow. year that he played at USC. Like, that's it. I, I think you have to have more than one class to be enrolled there. So he probably had like, I don't know, one or two online right. classes or something. But ballroom dancing was the one that I heard that he like had <laughs> on campus. That's awesome. And everything, and it was just football. The rest of it was just straight football. Me personally, you know, it took, <laughs> it took me five years to graduate college, and, you know. <laughs> Just take a little victory lap, baby. You're the first podcaster to graduate in five years. That's a that's the same as Will Shipley. Three years, 4.0 GPA. What was the best yeah, I, class you took in college? Oh, my goodness. What a great question. Well, the, the easy cop-out answer is we had a uh, broadcast radio class, which I okay. took and actually inspired me getting into this industry because I love it so much. But other than that... We had an appreciation to film class, which is exactly what you think it is. Yep. We just showed up and watched movies. I and did then the I, same thing. And then I read the I, and then I would either not watch the movie and fall asleep, or watch the movie. And if I watched the movie, er, and if I fell asleep, I would just go read the IMDb recap of it for when we had the quiz about what's easy movie money. Was about. So yeah, <laughs> easy money. I did. I took it in high school, and then I took another films class in college. And I agree. I think the best class I actually took from. Damn, there's a lot I didn't know about this was intro to space. I took as an elective. Yes. But it was yes. it was actually pretty hard. Not very difficult, but hard enough where I had to actually open a textbook and read about it cuz I don't know shit about space. So, that was a good one. The biggest joke I took was intro to religion where I mean <laughs> you you did not have to know or do anything. Literally anything. Anything. So, anyway. I I took I took an intro to the universe class, which is the same thing, same vibes. You know, like when I we went out there with a, a giant telescope at like midnight as a class and we like looked at it was stars. awesome. 
Dude, it was yeah, sick. You're on the was, rooftops of it, campus and you're just it was looking awesome. At it was yeah, awesome. Yeah. yeah. Stay in school, kids. Yeah, it's it's actually not terrible. Um so here's the thing with Shipley, man. To back to your play strength narrative or truths. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's not much leg drive, there's not much mass. He's fumbled seven times over the last two seasons, and he's yeah. not a guy that gets 300 touches. I mean, the fumble rate is concerning to me. I think he's a strength thing, man. And then the the thing that bothered me the most is that I did because we watched him for summer scouting and then I watched him this year. He didn't look as comfortable catching the ball this year. Not bad in any way, but there was some adjustments where I'm like, man, this is your bread and butter. Like you're mm-hmm. the guy that you're out there to catch the ball. Yeah. And it felt like there was times where I'm like, uh, it's a tough play, but one that you got to make for your role. So I really like the, I really like Shipley. I think he's going to be a third down running back in the NFL for a pretty long time. See, but, but here's here. See, so I want to agree with you. But the pass but, pro. But here's the problem. Hey, pass pro. So if you're a third, if you're a third down back. Let me rephrase and, that. And yeah, pass and catching back. Because that could be on any down. I agree. You're right. You might have to motion him out to the slot at times. I mean. But you know what I'm saying? Like, a, if you yeah, are just fair. like a pass catching back, then how much am I actually getting you in the football game? Right? No, you're it's right. Not, it's you're not right. that I don't like what Will Shipley brings to the table, but if he doesn't get stronger, which I, I don't know how much you can really expect a guy to get stronger. I know he's still a a, 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 a young man, a young adult. There's he can get stronger, but he's been in a pretty good strength and conditioning program at Clemson. So yeah. it's hard for me to think that he's going to get significantly stronger to be better in pass protection, to be an actual third down back in the league, or be somebody who can take tackles and take contact a little bit better than he did at college. And it's just hard to say. It's hard to look at a guy in college and say, Oh yeah, I've got strength concerns. You'll definitely get better at that when you get in the league. You right. know, it's not the exact same apples to apples conversation, but like that's why I have reservations about Olu Fashano, right? You're coming right. from a one of the best strength and conditioning programs in the country. Yes, he is a young player, but still you having strength deficiencies in college normally don't work out well for you at the NFL level. So it's no, kind of just that it's the same thing right there with Shipley, but um, what'd you think of uh, of 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 Marshawn Lloyd? All right, let me pull up my scouting report on Lloyd. I think for Lloyd, number one, I like you know, him. Obvious, I like him a lot because he's he's pretty dynamic as a runner. Really he good this, athlete, man. He has this gliding running style that, in a zone scheme, just flows naturally with the pace mm-hmm. of the blocks. I think he's got really quick feet for these short area cuts that are just vicious um stop and start i mean defenders are just lunging at air with a stop and start good variety of moves i mean juke spins stiff arms dude 99th percentile missed tackles force per attempt average and it, if mean, you've listened to this show before makes sense that's one of the metrics that we yes. love to use to try to um separate a running back from their offensive line right that's always the great question is are you a product of the line are you making things happen on your own Force missed tackles per attempt and right. yards after contact. Those are right. two big areas that I personally love to look at. I know that you look at too with the with the with the ultimate tool that we have. Um and and he was 99th percentile in that missed tackles forced per attempt average. Marshall Moy was. So he was RB7 for me for these reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, because all those things are great. And I, I also think he's a dangerous check down option. I mean, he had three games of 59 yes. plus receiving yards. Yes. Legit receiver. He, he runs low to the ground. Why he wasn't in my top five backs. He passes up a lot of holes to run outside, which you could do in that program. You can't run like he did at the NFL level. Yep. He tore his ACL in 2020. He missed games in both 2022 and 2023. He has been banged up while never topping 115 carries in a college season. I mean, yeah. he, he is not really had a workhorse load at any point of his college career and he's gotten hurt three of those years that screams committee running back at the nfl to me yeah he fumbled three times this year despite having very limited carries he leaves himself exposed to some really really big hits in space uh in pass pro he kind of lunges and ducks and some blitzers really threw him around. Yep. I mean, it, like ass in the air kind of. There's a couple around. of nice pass for yes. reps, but there it's are not some other ones a, where. Right. Yeah. It's not effort. It's more almost just kind of his build, which is weird because he's heavy. But it's just I mean, the thing is for me with Lloyd, 
he has all the gifts of a number one running back Mm -hmm. and all of the floor problems, injuries, ball security, pass pro issues of a guy that coaching staffs will sour on. Yeah. And I had a really tough time finding the balance of where to put him knowing those things. So I stuck him right in the middle. At RB7. Yeah. With with, uh, you know, the way that I have the running back rankings divvied out, it doesn't make this as clean of a bucket to put these guys in. But Marshawn Lloyd is in the same bucket as like a Jalen Wright from Tennessee, a Trey okay. Benson from Florida State. Like these are really good athletes, NFL caliber athletes for the running back position. They've got some of the best like home run ability that we have in the class. They've got the ability to switch fields. They got the ability to put their foot in the ground and go and just erase some angles. And you love that about them. Um, but with Lloyd specifically, the reason why he's lower on this list than those other guys that I mentioned, despite being a sort of similar athlete, is I just don't really trust how he sees the field right now. And the 2020 ACL injury, I think, really set him back because the 2021 season, you could tell that he was just trying to kind of get back into things. He started, but it was it, you know, he was kind of in and out of the lineup with South Carolina in 2022. That looked like his best year, but then he transfers over to USC. The problem with USC is you can see a little bit, a bit of that Caleb Williams problem with Marshawn Lloyd where he's not exactly trusting what he sees in front of him to get yeah. three or four yards on a play. He wants to get 90 yards on every single play. So there are times when I, I watch him deliberately hesitate the rushing lane to say, okay, is there something bigger? And I feel, I, I wonder if just that's how they're taught. Like, is that how USC's offense is taught? Always look for the biggest play because it's a Caleb Williams thing and it was a Marshawn Lloyd thing this past year for sure. So I don't know if you bring him into an NFL system and tell him to calm it down a little bit, tell him, hey, buddy, we don't need 80 yards every time you touch the ball. We just need a healthy four or five. And you are athletic enough. You can make people miss in space. We know you can get that from us. I don't know if that's ever going to be his style, though, because right now I don't love how he sees the field. He's a little bit hesitant when it comes to actual running in structure. I don't want to say between the tackles because some stuff can be, you know, mid zone, outside zone. You can have these pullers and sometimes the best um, path is outside of the tackles anyway. So I don't just want to say like between the tackles, but a little bit of that as well. He just doesn't go for those types of runs. He's, he is more of like, a, I got to go make the biggest play every single time I touch the ball, which is cool. And it works at USC. I don't know how much work it's going to get you at the Marshall NFL the level. I, I don't know how much work it's going to get you at the NFL level if you're sitting here, NFL defenders are catching you near the line of scrimmage half the time. Because uh, that's just not efficient enough, and that's why he's a little bit lower for me. But um, Ray Davis is the last guy that I just wanted to touch on uh, before we got into our top five. Because you got Tyrone Tracy in your top five, and I think yeah. we'll get to him in a second. But um, I like Ray Davis, man. Long journey for him. I mean, he started, where was it? Temple? Is that where Temple, he started? Temple. Transferred again. Vanderbilt. And then Vanderbilt. Kentucky. And I mean, he's just been all over the place. And um, I thought he actually played pretty well with Vanderbilt uh, even before he went to Kentucky. So he's got a couple of years of, of really good production under his belt. This is somebody who built really well, 5'10", 215 pounds. I mean, he could take good contact. This is somebody who can, who's can who got good balance. I think he's got great vision as well. He's a really yeah. nice one cut back. He's not going to be somebody who I think is the greatest athlete in the world, but as you will see as, as the, the rest of my rankings list goes on, how you see the field in RB vision, can you just give me those healthy four or five yards uh, every time that we give you the ball? I feel like Ray Davis – has the potential to do that even in the NFL. Like, is he going to be a a 40, 50 yard down the field home run type of hitter? No, probably not. But again, if you give me these healthy carries, man, I'll take that. That's what I need. I just need steady run game. Let me get these yards, set up these second and short, third and short, converting on second and four, uh, like all this kinds of stuff. And so I think Ray Davis has that potential too. And my favorite part about him is his footwork and how he sees the field. And so he was just out of my top five for that reason. Ray Davis is absolutely the Honda Civic of this running back. Hell class. yeah, baby. There's Nissan just, Altima just never quits. Right, 100%. I mean... There is so much to like with Ray Davis. He's a guy that I really watched closely during senior bowl practices, and he's just going to be a coaching staff favorite. Downhill runner, built like a bowling ball, does all the little things right, catches the ball really well, and has been productive as a pass catcher. Has a deeper running back route tree than a lot of guys in this class. 
I mean, he legitimately gets to work down the field at times. Yeah. And he did it at the Senior Bowl as well. Always keeps his leg churning through contact. Yeah. Uh, no fear of plowing forward. I think he's got sneaky wiggle when he sets up defenders thinking he's going with power. Caught seven touchdowns this year. I mean, very dangerous in the open field off slip screens because his tempo is perfect behind his blockers. And the reality with him is he's just got mediocre acceleration, long speed and explosiveness. He's a 24 year old prospect that got work across five seasons of college football. He's, you know, he's going to be not valued in the same way as the top guys because of those things. But he could really do everything you ask of him. He, uh, it's not the, the they, they're not similar in pass pro ways, but his style of running and kind of how he's seen in his body type does remind me of Kyron Williams, right? And I like, like that. Yeah. Williams is just a, I will fight for every yard. I've got really good vision. I'm a one cut guy. I'm right. never going to burn you up the sideline. Now, Williams, again, Williams had great pass pro tape going into the NFL, which I think helped him. And, and Davis doesn't have as much of that. No. But I think Davis has more rushing production than Kyron did to kind of give them maybe both an, an equal shot of when they came into the league, but his running style and just how he's built. Cause I just, I just double checked and um, Davis is actually just short of five foot nine. He's not five foot 10. So he's just short of five foot nine. He's about a little over 210 pounds. So Which, he's got a, he's I, got a, he, at the senior bowl, wasn't he like two twenty three? Oh, I did he lose all that weight. His, te- his play weight and testing weight is totally different. His, he plays he plays at 220, and you Google pictures of him, and he looks every bit of 220 plus. So, so he's got like 15, 20 pounds on Kyron anyways to be. Yes. He's more very, of a very thick. His combine weight is a total track, you know, number. Yeah, trying to get him a little bit faster. So, yeah, that's why I, I like Ray Davis. It sounds like you really do as well. Um, I do. We'll get into our top fives in a second. Got to shout out our friends over at Fabric by Gerber Life. If you guys have a family, you got to get them term life insurance to protect them, all right? It's one of the smartest financial decisions that you can ever make. And this time of year, it is perfect to get that done so you can focus on whatever. The rest of the year, the spring, the summer, everything has in store for you and your family. Fabric was designed by parents for parents to get you that high quality, surprisingly affordable term life insurance policies in less than 10 minutes. Fabric has flexible policies that will fit your family's budget with quality policies like million dollars in coverage for less than a dollar a day. Get your personalized quote in just minutes and then apply whenever it is convenient for you all online into your schedule. You can go from start to cover in less than 10 minutes with no health exam required. Join the thousands of parents who trust Fabric today to protect their family and apply today in just minutes at meetfabric.com slash stock exchange. Meetfabric.com, M-E-E-T, fabric.com slash stock exchange. Policies are issued by Western Southern Life Assurance Company, not available in certain states. Prices subject to underwriting and health questions. We got a five. Oh, you got Braylon Allen number yeah, five, Yeah, it's a right? perfect time for us to talk about Allen because you had him at 10. Yep. So when I introed the pod, this was the player I soured on the most. I thought going in after I did a film review on him for NBC during the season, watched him last summer. I've watched him since he was, what, like a 17-year-old getting carries in college football, which is yeah. insane. He, he enrolled in college early. And uh, I thought he'd be a top three back for me. And honestly, he just made it at five. Mm-hmm. It, it was really, I, I would really tear him, Corum, and almost Lloyd together nearly. And then there's going to be a different jump in tier from four to one. With Allen, there, there is good things. I want to be very clear here. He's going to play his entire NFL rookie season as a 20-year-old. He's got rare size. It's nuts. I mean, there is a lot for this dude to grow into and improve. He's got pretty rare size. He's 6'1", 235. I think he played above 240. That just creates tackling issues at every level of the field. I mean, he's he's bigger than most linebackers. He forced at least 45 missed tackles all three seasons at college. So think about that. That's as a 17, 18, and 19-year-old. That's insanely productive in terms of missed tackles forced considering his age. Uh, I think he's got good feet for his size when defenders come in low. When he gets mm-hmm. to the second and third level, the stiff arm just it makes defenders look like children. He squares up against blitzers utilizing that mass. He blocks square. He doesn't really like duck his head and get yep. sideways. Um, and when you do get him at that second and third level of the field, I like his strides. Like he can really eat up a lot of grass and and not turn. He's not going to turn into a four three guy, but he's got big run ability there. Why I soured on him when Wisconsin pivoted to his own heavy scheme in 2023, which is not what he was brought there to do. 
he was not the same player at all. Just did not. And guess what? A lot of teams in the NFL run zone run game. So it, that's not that's a that's a red flag to me. That yeah. is he just a gap scheme downhill kind of runner? Yeah, his initial burst is below average. Yeah. He had four four fumbles in two of his three college seasons. The pass game work is just check down screens and swing passes, and he is not an overly comfortable pass catcher. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's a noticeable delay when he's transitioning from catching the ball to going into open field runner. And that kind of negates the idea of getting a guy in space at his size, because if you're delayed transitioning, the tacklers are going to arrive. So with Allen, I mean, his ceiling as a runner is extremely, extremely high. But right now, without any pass catching ability and being very scheme specific, he's a compliment compliment runner, you know, that's downhill red zone tackle breaker. And yeah. at 20, I love the promise. But I, when he came into this program as an underclassman, I, I expected much bigger things for him as an NFL prospect. And he just didn't improve in some areas that you'd hope he'd improve. Right. It's I, I want to. Him being a young prospect is great. He started for three years, though, right? You know? So it's like you you don't exactly. He, he's coming at a younger age, obviously. Like I understand the age metric is there, but it's hard for me to go. Oh, he's twenty. He'll get way better in the pros. He already started for three. Like he's already had three years of of a full carry load to get better. And I agree with you. I felt like he kind of just stayed the same back which is impressive i think it's an nfl back but how impactful is that going to be right i don't think he's a um i don't think he is a rare athlete at his size i think he's a a good athlete at his size but how much does that play into more than just committee work um and really is he athletic enough to maintain that really healthy yards per carry average. You mentioned how often teams like to go with zone. If you have a player who really can't do a lot for you and behind his own blocking scheme, that's kind of tough. That you know that makes you pretty one-dimensional when you kind of come in the game and your know, defense might be able to key in on that. Kind of they might be able to condense the formation if they know a run is coming and then Allen's in the game and they know they're not going to run him behind his own blocking stuff. Okay, well, is is that going to kind of tip your hand a little bit? Is it going to get easier to defend? Can you stack in between the tackles a little bit better? That's all stuff that I think about. I also worried at times about his decision making in space because where I think he is actually pretty good with chaos, right? I think that his feet are more nimble than you would yeah. expect for a guy who's 235, 240 pounds. And I think that he has some decent one cut ability when it comes to work near the line of scrimmage. The whole point of a great blocking scheme and the whole point of making people miss is to what? It's to get into space. And so with that being the goal, I sometimes saw Allen just not look as comfortable in space where it's like, you know, sometimes I'm not saying this is, this is every time with him, but sometimes you'll get a ball carrier who makes it into open space and either doesn't trust their athleticism or they just feel uncomfortable there. And they're almost like looking around who's the closest guy that I can throw my shoulder into when in reality, it's like, okay, well, I would like you to run away from them a little bit further. You know, sometimes the situation calls for it, but sometimes you can see guys, seeking contact instead of space i felt like that was the case at times with Allen, and it's just if the whole goal is to get you in space and i feel as though you're a little bit uncomfortable when you get there it's tough for me to really trust you as a playmaker when things go exactly the way that they need to the size the footwork the stiff arming the one cut ability i think it can yield a pretty good yards after contact average, he had above a 3.0 uh, yards per yards after contact average over the last two years, which is which is good. That's fine. Um, but after that, what kind of a player are you? And I just I, I am left very unsure of Allen. So maybe I'm way too low on just a six foot one plus 240 pound athlete back there running back. Maybe I'm just way too low on a player like that. And, and like you said at the beginning of the podcast, big guys win at the NFL level. Maybe that's really all that it should have meant with him, but that's the reason why I had him a lot lower because I just didn't I, – I don't know. I, I don't have as much faith um, in him as other players behind zone blocking schemes, that feel for space, what you're doing when it's not just, hey, let me follow this blocker, let me make this one guy miss, and then I'll kind of go down. We'll go to live another day. Yeah, I would love to see – and maybe they don't do this because they already got their guy – in Gus Edwards, 
but I would love to see the Chargers find a way to get him in Harbaugh's scheme. Is it weird that, like, I'm not kidding. That's the jersey I picture him in. No, it's... Why is that? Am I thinking of somebody? Is this a psychological experiment? Because you you also saying the Chargers is really weird Are you weird thinking to me. of uh, Michael Turner? Is no. Who, not Michael Turner. Um, not Michael Turner. Oh, this is going to drive me nuts. Who Who is the big back that retired due to a medical issue from the Chargers? From the Chargers? I don't know. Was drafted early. Well, Michael Turner was definitely a big back that played in the Chargers. He was 244 I, pounds. Are you, ta- are, you, are you talking about Ryan uh, Matthews? I am thinking of Ryan Matthews. I don't think he's like Ryan Matthews. But he's not it, wasn't Ryan Matthews big? big? Not nearly as big. He was 220, Ryan Matthews. That's big, but not Braylon Allen big. Yeah. That's yeah, yeah. that's a bigger back. I love No, Michael Ryan Turner Matthews. was 240 when he played for the Chargers. I love Ryan Matthews. Okay, this is just really weird that you said the Chargers out of any team because as I was literally explaining him right there a couple of minutes ago, I'm thinking of him doing these things in a Chargers uniform. Him in the powder blue is... That's extremely strange. Meant to be. Meant to be. We got some weird stuff going on right now. Okay, <laughs> uh, num- number five for me, I have Bucky Irving. Please tell me Whoa. Bucky Irving is... He's outside your top ten? Yes. Oh, dude. Yes. And I... Man, I, I thought I liked Bucky Irving, but you love Bucky No, you're Bucky a hater, Irving. dude. You're a massive hater. I am hater. scarred on really, really small backs that are bad athletes. Like my like the Michael Carter experience, who's an okay NFL player, but when you are really small and and to be combine, fair to Michael, his, his Michael Carter's agilities tough, were phenomenal. So let me actually take that back. Irving didn't do agilities at the combine. But bro, you're 192 pounds and you didn't test well. It's I just, not I just can't time. I just can't. I just can't it's do not- it. His, I just love and okay. This is the part. This is the part that we were going to talk about. I love his vision. I love how he sees the field. I love how he sets guys up. All right, but right. Irving was a one hundredth percentile player over the last two seasons when it comes to missed tackles forced per attempt. He had this guy had almost Bijan Robinson level. Missed tackles, forced per attempt averages. He was a 0. .40. Bijan was like 0. .44. Travis Etienne was po- no, no. Bijan was 0. .42. Travis Etienne was 0. .42, and Javante Williams was 0. .44. And Bucky Irving's like right there in that category with these guys who are like elite at, at forcing missed tackles. And you know, here's the thing: you know he's not doing it with elite athletic gifts. You turn on the tape and you see right. that from him. He's just doing it because he un- he sees the game faster than everybody else that he's playing against. And I am just such a sucker for a good vision back. And that is Bucky Irving to me. He is smaller. There's no doubt about it. But I think he's got a lot of fight in him. When he gets up against these linebackers, even some of these defensive linemen, those legs keep churning as best they can. He will try to stay balanced. He will get that one or two yards that absolutely surprise you. So, look, I don't think that he's going to be somebody who's going to be hitting home runs at the NFL level. But he is somebody who I love what he could do as a receiver. Like, I loved his hands out of the backfield. I thought he was a really nice receiver. I thought that his um, body control, his balance, his footwork allows him to have some really nice routes out of the backfield that could, again, set people up once you get into space. So I think he has that ability to him. And he just, he, dude, he anticipates things so well, and he turns it into production. I love Bucky Irving because of that. I am terrified about the athletic testing that he had at the Combine. But damn it, I'm going to fall for it because when guys see the field that well, I just, I, it's, uh, it's such a, I'm such a sucker for that trait. It means the most to me because we have seen so many athletes, great athletes, come through college football and get to the NFL level, and they can't do crap in the NFL because they can't see the field sure. the way that they need to. And I'm zero percent worried about Bucky Irving in that regard. So outlier and a lot of different things, but I got to bet on the trait that I measure most for him. So maybe he does end up being somebody who, okay. You know how you have like thresholds uh, for certain players. Maybe there is just truly a threshold of a or a, a, like a floor of like, okay, you you could have really great vision, but if you are not at least this big, if you are not this tall enough right. to ride the NFL ride, then you are just not going to succeed as a running back. So perhaps we look back and this ends up being a really good scouting lesson for me. But for now, it's really hard for me not to be a sucker for what he puts out there on tape. 
I, and I get it. The tape is is really good. He number one that you said has just natural awareness, anticipation, feel, vision. Um, he's someone that you know has been really productive with the touches he's had, both on the ground and through the air. I just don't know if I'm an NFL coach. I don't know what exactly. I this can guy's do got, with him. This guy's got more yards after contact per attempt so than he's Braylon a, he's Allen an early, does. He's an early than down Braylon runner. Braylon Allen does. He's an early down runner in the NFL at 190 pounds. And that was his combine weight. So he got up to that for the combine. I don't know if that holds up at hey, all. I think he's draftable. Fine. I am Fine. a certified hitter. Oh, he's using the word draftable. <laughs> <laughs> he's using uh, the word draftable. He definitely is. Fifth round. Connor wouldn't Sign take him to up. the seventh. <laughs> no, no. He's a top of day three kind of thing. <laughs> he's a top of day three kind of thing. Okay, pick. but here's – all right, so here's the thing. I also wouldn't be taking Bucky Irving before, like, late third, you know? Okay, so you you he's RB the- He's RB5 for me, but, like, okay. he's a mid-round player. You know, I'm not yeah, that's taking fair it. when you look at this class as a whole. I mean, yeah, I only I'm, I'm had... not taking I'm not taking Irving until I probably honestly like the same range. Like I'm not taking him until most likely early part of the fourth round. Like if I'm thinking, hey, here's yeah. the beginning of the fourth round. I can take a good playmaker out of the backfield. That's Bucky Irving spot for me. I'm just lower on this running back class a little bit overall. Yeah, I am, too. I don't really but have a lot of day I, two grades. I'm going to give a lot of, I think, mid round grades to, to a lot of these. Yep. Guys. They're either like mid round, third round picks to mid round, fourth round picks, something like that what i think is gonna happen all right so rb4 for me has tracy, a third right? round grade that's tyrone tracy okay. jr who i mean what a, a, a an incredible transfer for purdue played uh a wide receiver at iowa transfers to purdue as a running back he's obviously he's a playmaker in both the run and pass game I mean, explosive and agile tester, 94th percentile, ver, 89th percentile, three cone, incredibly creative runner on tape, finesse and power in his game. He forced 46 missed tackles on just 114 attempts this season. Yeah, yeah. Really good balance, really good flexibility, a complete natural in the pass game, which isn't surprising considering he was a wide receiver. I think he's got the skill set and mindset to become an elite third down running back, return kicks, Brought one back for a touchdown in 2023. The weaknesses to me are things that he just needs to grow into by actually getting to play the position. Mm -hmm. He's still learning the pacing and flow of run designs. He only had one year of quality production because he really only had one full year of a chance to be a running back. I don't care that he's 24 because it's not like he's been a running back for six years and just getting ran into the line of scrimmage. This is new to him and he the flashes are amazing, and his skill set fits everything in the mold of today's NFL running back for all three downs. I, Tracy, he is such a creative runner, and he's such a good athlete that you are confident. The things that translate to me, like you said, Trevor, the missed tackles force per attempt and the high-end athleticism and the floor in the pass game. When you check all three of those boxes, you're probably going to be a good NFL running back. I <laughs> He's so much fun. Oh, I, have awesome. RB, I, have, I have him at RB. I have I have him at RB9 because I don't really know what the hell to do with him, right? Because yeah. so a little bit of a background for him. So he started his career at Iowa, played wide receiver at Iowa for most of his time there, ended up transferring yeah. to Purdue in 2022. He played like wide receiver slash running back a little bit at Purdue, but then they went through a coaching change going into his last year, and they wanted to move him to running back and he was like man i've been a receiver my whole college career and i get this from his perspective like he was like i've been a wide receiver for most of my college career i'm running out of eligibility now in my last year you want me to switch positions and if it doesn't work i have no shot at the nfl like because if 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 what happened in 2023 doesn't happen he's a complete afterthought like he's he's not yep. making it to the league so he was really hesitant about doing that but then he was like it, yeah he trusted the coach i think that came in who was like dude i know he could be a great running back he gets a running the coach back. recruited him i talked to him about this the coach recruited him as a high schooler i think he was a gatorade indiana player of the year he was the coach recruited him as a high schooler to play running back and and tyrone tracy was like i'm a receiver and right, the coach was right, like there you're you a running back 
Then it didn't work up to the standards he had hoped at wide receiver. The same coach came back to recruit him as a transfer running back. And he was like, all right, maybe you were right. <laughs> Dude, he is. So here's my here's my um, little blurb about him. When he transferred to Purdue, there was some split work at running back and wide receiver in his first year. But his second year, he was all in on running back and looked like a natural. He has an upright running style, but he remains balanced on his feet for good yards after contact. He has a true make you miss type of a running style with really good elusiveness and one cut ability. The lack of experience as a running back yields some inconsistencies with how he sees blockings and space and where space will be. Um, on third downs, his hands and his route running are obviously very good given his background, though he has some really good length and willingness and pass protection, his strength and confidence in that assignment is still hit and miss, but could certainly get better. Bottom line, Tracy Jr. is a natural playmaker with adequate athleticism, both explosively and with agility for a zone blocking scheme, but he must continue to improve in how he sees space in order to become a consistent rotational starter or a consistent rotational player and even a starter. This is somebody who, man, it's just his tape is is fun like he 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 the, the fact uh, he plays with such high pad leverage that you go like you are really a wide receiver just giving the ball back then. right like you can tell he hasn't trained in like the i get the ball in my gut i'm going low i got the pad levels down he instead they hand him the ball he's standing straight upright and he just becomes a receiver after the catch 100 percent. That, that is what he <laughs> and he's just like all right time to make somebody miss like time to some time to break some ankles He's got really great balance despite uh, not being not being super low to the ground like you see a lot of running backs do. And he just, he's not going to look like your traditional running back. He's not. But he is such a great playmaker out of the backfield. I could see a rotational role for him at the NFL level at worst as this kind of like third down, swing back, change of pace type of a player. Um, somebody who's going like to give you uh, that sort of energy. So Tr- Tracy, man, he's he's fun. I obviously didn't have him in my top five, but uh, but he is fun. And he knows how to block. So that's he is will uh, he is definitely willing with his blocking. There's no doubt about yes. that. He is definitely willing. All right. So who'd you have a four? So I have Trey Benson at four. Okay. He's my number one running back. Okay. All right. So he was both of our number one running backs going into yeah, this season. Right. And I got a little bit lower on him because his individual numbers this past season all went down. The yep. missed tackles forced per attempt that we loved going into the season that was incredible from last year went down a little bit, as did the yards after contact. But the yards after contact didn't go down nearly as much. The The reason why I've I've kind of like dinged him a little bit more than I think you have after kind of just saying, yep, and agreeing with me there with you kind of seeing the same thing is, again, it comes down to a vision thing for me. When I watched Trey Benson this year, I – I saw some flashes of really good vision, but also some inconsistencies with some obvious rushing holes and 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 sometimes when it was like, man, you've got to be able to see that in, or, or in order to get the better yards. Benson is an incredible athlete. He's one of the best athletes in this class, especially for given his weight. But there are too many times I saw this past year, he just tried to out-athlete people. Not nearly as much as Marshawn Lloyd was, and I think it was more of an issue for Marshawn Lloyd, but I still saw that in Benson, and it's just really hard to be a, that kind of back at the NFL level. Now, I also sort of had the same concerns about Kenneth Walker, and Kenneth Walker is doing pretty dang good for Seattle when he's out there and when he's healthy. And I had so, those concerns as well. So I, I fully admit that it's like, okay, I have these concerns for him, but it, it, you can become an incredibly productive player, especially for how good of an athlete Benson is. And so those were my overall thoughts on him. Really liked him coming into the season because I thought he was a more efficient player. He takes a step back in those efficiency areas, and I think the root of it came from how he saw the field. That spooks me a little bit. It doesn't mean that I don't think he's going to be a productive back. I still think you're picking him within the top 100. I think he is a rotational committee type of a player at worst, and he can absolutely evolve into a – Kenneth Walker type, a Dalvin Cook type of player. Like I to me, he he has that style, that ability to bounce off of tackles and continue to gain speed and be a home run hitter. Like all of that is within the cards for him. But also I could see the other side of it. And maybe that's uh, maybe I'm a little bit more skittish and worried than I should be, but that's ultimately why he's number four for me. He's close to that category of of guys that uh, I think could be RB1s at the next level. I just a little spooked by some of what I saw this year from him. Yeah, admittedly, it's an underwhelming top back of the class, right? He's my RB1. 
You know, I, I don't have him in my top 50 players. I still love the contact balance. He's a tap dancer in tight areas. He, I've said this before. He's the master of turning a dead play into a three yard gain. It's really, really impressive how he could do that. I think the upside as a pass catcher is what really sold me here. They did not throw him the ball enough. They, they didn't. And when you watch the 32 passes that he catches throughout his college career, you're looking at it and going with his athleticism, mm -hmm. with his contact balance and space and his feet. And I think he looks relatively natural catching the ball. Why the hell didn't they throw this guy the football? So mm -hmm. I think there's a lot. I think he has a much more promising pass catching future in the NFL than he did in college. If they expand his route tree, I thought the angry runs from 2022 were awesome. I wish there was more of them in 2023. I'm sure. totally with you that that disappointed me. I thought the acceleration on tape, that instant acceleration was missing. Uh, he's almost too patient where it doesn't unlock that sub 4-4 speed enough. And I think he got better in pass pro from 2022 to 2023. But this is even something he said to me right away. He's very focused in on getting better in that area. And he has yep. to as a three down player. So uh, there's a lot I really like about Benson. Um, I don't think superstar as a top running back, mm -hmm. but I think kind of that reliable future starting running back that'll be able to handle all three downs with more ceiling as a pass catcher than he had in college. So let's talk about Jalen Wright from Tennessee. Do you have him in the top five as well? He's number two for me. Okay. So uh, that's, it's good that you have him at two. Cause I have, um, I have Jalen Wright at three. So we, we, I think, see these players similarly. They're in sort of that same bucket. They're right next to each other. And I do that. I mean, that's how I see Jalen Wright from Tennessee. You know, one year full-time starter this past year, but he was the first 1,000-yard rusher at Tennessee since Jalen Hurd in 2015. I thought that was crazy when I, when I, when yeah. I read that. Um, when he was in high school, he won an indoor state title for the 55-meter dash as a sophomore, had a 6.29 in the 55-meter dash, which checks out for all the explosive numbers that he had at the Combine just because you can watch this guy on tape too. He puts his foot in the ground, and he can absolutely go. Um, I think that he, you know, despite having that sideline speed, he has good patience too. And again, like yeah. I, I really gravitated towards the patience that he showed despite not having a ton of – full-time work in college this was somebody who had the athleticism to be able to i would understand some of what i saw with benson where it was like yeah all right you want to get the sideline every time like i get it like you're just you're that athletic but i felt as though he was more patient that, that he was willing to wait th for things to to uh to unfold in front of him i really liked the footwork i liked how he was able to hop behind the line of scrimmage and when he got to the line of scrimmage that one cut ability that allowed him to hit space and then we hit open space man he could absolutely take off and i think that, that athleticism really takes over the reason why i have jalen wright overall above trey benson i think they're both pretty decent as receivers jalen wright to me is the best pass protector of, of any of the running backs in this class He's got the size, he's got the strength, and the thing is, he doesn't even have the experience really. Like he's sort no. of been in that role over the last couple of years. This year, he was in it a lot, and he he would go straight up with guys that are coming in, linebackers, safeties, blitzing corners, chip blocks, whatever. He to me is the best pass protecting guy in this class, and so when it comes to getting on the field early, I think he has the ability to that. So to do that, so I, I like Jalen Wright from Tennessee a good amount, man. I I really do. He was dangerously close to being my top back. I mean, couldn't have been closer. Him and Benson, to me, are side by side. I fell in love with Jalen Wright throughout this process. Shot out of a cannon, straight line sprinter, always wins the foot race against defensive ends and linebackers. When he gets that momentum going, which he almost always does, he drives through defenders on the back end. Natural hands makes an effort to stay square and level and pass pro. I mean, the thing for me with him is he gets a little bounce happy. His runs sometimes when they lack feel, they just become unnecessarily chaotic. I'm like, you know what I mean? It's just like this run didn't need to have five defenders around you there's, where you have to do something insane. <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot of there's a lot of things like that where it's like it. it, it, it I think more carries will alleviate some of that. I yeah. think so too. Not really a ton of lateral quickness on tape, but I guess when you're that fast in a straight line, it, it doesn't matter as much. Uh, he fumbled five times over the last two years, but only one this year. So he got a lot better from 2022 to 2023. 
I, I have a second round grade on Jalen Wright. I so do I. I love the player. I, yeah. I think he was the guy that moved up the most for me from the middle of the season to now. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. Same thing for me. I mean, I, I didn't really have him on my radar even. And right. He was popping in in our grading system, and we were RB3 both like. Mm. So um, I've got Blake Corum as RB two. Okay. And you know, the more I sat here and thought about it, I love Blake Corum so much. The previous season, you know, yeah. I just the missed tackles forced per attempt, the yards after contact, um, the first downs gained on third down, like the third down efficiency for him. Um, I understand that he he isn't the best athlete out there, right? I mean, he is. What was what was the final measurables for? Blake Corum. He's like 5'7", 205. He is 5'7", 205. Um, right. 60th percentile 40-yard dash, 63rd percentile vertical jump, 89th percentile three-cone drill, 94th percentile bench press. Let's go, baby. Short yeah. arms. We're pumping those things He's out. Like he has pistons. some of the shortest arms yeah, in top my history. Boom, yeah. boom, <laughs> boom, like, boom. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Go off, King. Uh, so, But here's the thing about Corum. The shorter strides definitely go into him just not being able to be this kind of getaway athlete. He's not. If, if you're looking for a home run hitter, if you're trying to get a really vertical run game, he's he's probably not going to be your cup of tea. What I trust Blake Corum to do better than every single back in this class is read the line of scrimmage, react to chaos as it's coming around you, stay calm, stay poised, stay balanced, get those yards after contact, and just see that open space better than anybody else. Him and Bucky Irving are those two guys that just anticipate better than everybody does. And just behind that Michigan offensive line, I understand people go like, oh, of course he was productive. It was Michigan's offensive line, but I genuinely think that it was Corum as well. Like if if, if Corum does not – um, get yeah. injured in November of last year. I think he comes out of the draft last year. I think he's a he's a top fifty pick. I think he gets picked probably somewhere in the second round, but before pick fifty, somewhere around there. I think he's probably outside of the top fifty now because of that injury. And this past year just wasn't as good. But he ended the year really strong. He tested fine for I think his athletic limitations of being somebody who is five foot seven and has those shorter stride lengths, but. But the receiver ability out of the backfield, I think, is phenomenal. He is a willing pass protector, although, of course, for a guy who's five foot seven at 205 pounds, it's not going to go great for you. But it's just that compact build. He has those weaknesses that come with it, but boy, does he have those strengths. I mean, the core strength is fantastic. The leg drive is fantastic. Uh, the balance is, to me, incredible. And two of the top traits that I have for a running back to get me those healthy yards after contact and those yards, uh, those just yards per attempt averages, I want you to see the field well, and I want you to be balanced. Those things matter so much to me because people love the harp on, and we've talked about this before, people love the harp on the 40-yard runs, the 50-yard runs, What when you get up the sideline and it's this highlight real thing and we all see it on red zone and we go, whoa, crazy, what a run. So many more times in the NFL, you will have the opportunity to gain four or five yards to help your offense out. And Blake Corum, to me, does that better than basically any back in this class. If I need somebody to get, have a healthy yards per carry average to keep my offense moving on any given down, I trust him to be able to do that. And that's why I, I have him as RB2 in this class because if, if I'm going to boast, like I said, if I'm going to boast those traits as the two that carry the highest weight for me, yes, it all kind of spits out a formula for all of these guys to be stacked against each other to let different skill sets shine. But that to me is the X factor of these tiers and these buckets of, of these running backs that I have here is that Blake Corum just sees it so well. And he feels like that type of back that every time that you get him the football, he is giving you three to four yards. And I'll take that. Every day. Yeah, the floor of Corum is is excellent. I mean, not overly explosive or fast, and he's small, but pound for pound strength, great balance. The best understanding of what he's asked to do in the run out of any runner in the class, and it's not even close. Like, when it's drawn up, Corum knows exactly where he needs to go, what timing he needs to have. Um, he just has great trust in his rush lanes. Really, really well coached up in pass pro and staying square uses his leverage to his advantage. I don't think he'll factor in much in the outside zone running game. And I just thought this year, man, I know he got hurt. He looked so worn down compared to 2022. But I thought the end of the year looked better. Right. But so I'm just it, talking about it made me think he was getting more confident with the knee. 
Probably, but it's just it's just a matter of that size with all of the touches he's had in college. And that's fair. Is that's that fair. gonna be a problem after two years in the, the NFL? And that's fair. So that's fair. Um Jonathan Brooks, last guy. Yeah, number three for me. Talk to me about is he Jonathan number Brooks. one for you? He is number one for me. Yep. Okay, yep. so Brooks, obviously coming off the ACL. I want to pull up my scouting report on him. Um, you know, AC, which ACL is, injury in oh, November, which sucks. A little bit of a factor in this process, of course. Why am I an idiot and can't find my job? Here we go. Jonathan Brooks report. <laughs> Got it. I know how to use a computer. All right. So maybe. maybe. I think with Brooks, okay, so here's the really good. Plus acceleration, he can beat the defense to the edge. Mm -hmm. Really good feel as a runner with these sharp cuts Mm -hmm. in Texas's run scheme. Knows how to get skinny through really, really tight rush lanes, slippery in space, off of screens and check downs. The movement skills and flashes in the pass game show a guy that is ready for more. Like, I, I think you could motion him out to the slot. I think you can get him in one-on-one matchups with linebackers and nickels and ask him to win in those ways. I think he's got really good awareness and vision pre- and post-snap as a pass protector, which really impressed me for a young running back. Like, he kind of knew where the rush was coming from that he had to help out with. My thing that separated him from being the top running back in this class was I don't think he has really any leg drive to grind out extra yards. Like, I did not see that power profile in the lower half. He gets a little too patient rather than banging between the tackles to just get downhill consistently. Um, the torn ACL is going to slow him down as a rookie, but he'll be he'll be fine with that. I love his awareness in pass pro, but in the actual rep, he's he ducks his head all the time and his shoulder. It's constant. Like, I don't know if I'm strong enough. And that kind of goes back to the lower half leg power where I'm like, does he not trust that lower half strength here? where he's kind of lunging to generate more force. So Brooks is kind of that guy where it's like, okay, if he goes to a run scheme that you have a lot of confidence in, McVay, LaFleur, those kinds of guys, like he's going to get what's there with the kind of athlete he is and the kind of feel he has. I just don't know if he'll ever have the power profile to be a great running back. He just feels like a guy that's trapped in being a good one. I think if the injury didn't exist for Jonathan Brooks, I t- personally don't think this is even a conversation for most people. I, I think that what we saw from him, the fact that he's only a redshirt sophomore, the fact that he has the lack of wear and tear, the tread on the tires, if you will, I think he was the best all-around back that we had in college football this past year. Are some backs a little faster than him? Sure. Are some like a, a little bit better at contact balance than him? Sure. But you look at this guy, he is above 50th percentile in size and in length for a run, for the running back position. I think he's got really nice long speed. For only starting for one year, I think he sees the field incredibly well. He's got a good knack for one-cut ability. He's got good lateral ability despite his size. Um, I think he's got good hands in the receiving game. Pass protection is a work in progress, but I think it's coming along. To me, I think that this is a, they say five-tool player in baseball. Like I think this is five-tool player at running back. Like I think, I think Jonathan Brooks gives you everything you want from the position, and I think, I I think it's it sounds like I'm more confident since he's RB one for me and he's RB three for you. Yeah, I believe this is a scheme versatile back who could be productive in any system for any team. I really do. If we get the pre ACL injury version of Jonathan Brooks and can allow that guy to get better and see the field even better with more carries, to me. He brings everything to the table that you would want for the running back position. My my kind of like bottom line scouting report thing that I have in the in the draft guide is Brooks is an ideal blend of size, speed, strength, and agility. Though he has limited snap totals, he has good vision in both gap and run schemes. Uh, if he can get back to form fo- following the ACL, he has all the tools to be a starting running back for any team in the NFL. So that's how we ended up with him at RB one. All right, here we go. Interesting class. A yes. lot of a lot of varying floors, ceilings, skill sets, roles, and Indeed. they're all clustered in a pretty tight group. Indeed. So, unfortunately, folks, we're on a time crunch, but please ask us about guys like Audric Estime and Cody Schrader because I want to yeah. talk about those guys in the comments, like the Del lobby, Lobby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like all these dudes, I would I would love to hear from you guys. Please let us know in the comment section. Best way to do that: YouTube.com/backslash NFL Stock Exchange. If you literally just say, "Hey, what do you think about Audric Estime?" 
I will try to go back and give you our thoughts because I want to talk about these guys. We're just on a little bit of a time crunch here because we got to get out of here. So uh, audio only, if you want to hit us up and ask those questions as well, you can at Tampa Bay Trey, at Connor J. Rogers on both Instagram and Twitter. Um, 25K subs on YouTube. Whoa, I didn't know that. I knew we were Y'all, getting close. We, we're Not only are we getting close, buddy, we've eclipsed it. Y'all are, y'all are incredible. Wow, y'all are the amazing. goats. We love you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, Connor, you got anything else before we get out of here? No, man. I know uh, we got to run the day as we always do these long shows that we love. And we'll have another positional breakdown this week. We will. Maybe. Yeah, we I think will. So. I think we're going we're to. We're running out of time. So we're trying to get through them. <laughs> we're, trying, we're trying to get as many as we can. But uh, we believe. We will have another position breakdown for you guys. You can comment and ask which one that you would want to see. Uh, We've already done wide receiver corner, uh, edge rusher, quarterback, and offensive tackle. We will circle back around to those, but we're going to try to get to a couple others before we get to that. So if you have a suggestion of ones that we haven't done yet, please let us know in the comments also. I'm Trevor Sikkima. That is Connor Rogers. Thank you guys so much for watching and listening to the NFL Stock Exchange Podcast. See you guys later this week.